started. Uh, is there any questions uh, before we start about the assignment or anything? OK. OK, uh, so today what we'll talk about is uh, security policies, so policies and procedures. So uh, policies are important uh, component uh, to security, and it's one that's often not explored. So a lot of the concepts in this course are, are sort of the types of things that kind of fall through the cracks when you take an like a sort of traditional view of security. You know, you look at crypto, you look at network, you look at OS, you look at application security, but there's things that, that, that don't tend to get covered, okay? And so what I'd like to look at uh, both today and then uh, from a more technical perspective uh, for the next two lectures are what you might refer to as a policy or a procedure or a process. Okay, so these are the kinds of things, uh, if we go back to Stride, uh, we can think about where they fit in Stride. And so these are the types of things that often result in the E in Stride, uh, which is escalation of privilege. So uh, when I, I set out in order to uh, restrict your ability to do certain things. I give you permission to do some things and not permission to do other things, okay? So you're authorized to do something or you're not authorized to do something. Uh, and if you can evade that somehow or get around it, usually because of like a loophole, loophole not being a technical term, uh, but that type of thing, uh, then it could result in an escalation of privilege. So you're given more privileges than you actually should. Okay, and so we've already seen examples of this. Okay, so some of the examples we saw were uh, in social engineering, uh, we talked about this attack on uh, Matt Honan. Uh, someone went to steal his Twitter. And you'll remember that the critical detail there was that Amazon would not reset his password, would not reset the password for the, the adversary impersonating uh, the user uh, because the adversary didn't know the last four digits of a credit card number. But when the adversary asked to add a new credit card number, right, then Amazon did not need to fully validate their uh, that information and so they didn't ask for the last four digits in order to do that task and then of course once a new credit card was added then the adversary now does know the last four digits of a credit card and so they're able to um, they're able to, to reset the password uh, for at Matt okay so that's an escalation of privilege right the adversary should not have been able to reset the password they found a loophole by adding a new credit card which didn't require like the strictest amount of authorization and authentication, strictest amount of authentication, I should say. And then uh, because of the loophole, they were able to authenticate uh, and then they were able to, to uh, be authorized to do the tasks that they wanted to do in the first place. Uh, other things we saw is we looked at uh, SSL certificates. And so uh, we looked through the whole process of uh, trying to figure out whether you actually own the domain that you want the certificate for and there's like a long involved process that might involve emailing you and any level of, you know, there, there were a lot of attacks that we came up with the attack tree. If you attack DNS, if you attack the right passwords, you know, the domain registrar, uh, if you're able to intercept the email, there's all sorts of ways of, of getting uh, that certificate even though you don't actually own it, okay? And so that was a procedure. The, the certificate authority decided this is the procedure that we're going to use to try and figure out whether someone actually owns a domain or not, okay? And if you're able to break the procedure, in other words, convince the CA that you own the domain when you don't own the domain, then that's a loophole in the procedure and that's, uh, there, therefore it's an escalation of privilege attack. And uh, policy flaws, they, they don't have to necessarily be the, the end all of an attack. So, the at mat thing we brought up because we we're talking about social engineering, so it was sort of a blend, right? There was uh, the they violated the policy, uh, but they also used social engineering as well by impersonating uh, Matt. And so uh, yeah, so so you don't have to think about attacks as and same with Stride. It not all attacks fit cleanly. Like this is only a, an escalation of privilege. It's not a tampering. It's not a spoofing attack. Often attacks are. are 
uh, complicated and they involve uh, different components. Now, the reason that I'm interested in policies in this course, because it's about security evaluation methodologies, is that there are no methodologies for this, okay? So just like social engineering, we're going to try to just understand what the problem is. We're going to try and see lots of examples, uh, and then that hopefully will help us uh, try and think about how to prevent these attacks, okay? Uh, because we don't have a, there, there's no static analysis for policies or there's no um, formal verification methods or, or things like that, okay? So we're sort of lacking in, in uh, the study of this. Okay, so today I'll show you some quick examples just so that you get a feel for what we mean by policies. Then we'll do a kind of longer uh, example on airport security. So we'll walk through the different policies and procedures that are used. And then uh, over the next two classes, we'll look at a more technical example of a policy, uh, which is called the same origin policy. It's implemented in browsers. There's also an accompanying policy that's very similar that was established around the same time uh, surrounding cookies. So we'll look at both of those uh, side by side. So um, that, that will be in, won't be today. Okay, so let's uh, think of some examples of policies and s security incidents that arise uh, as a result of policies. And these are things that probably a handful of them you've heard of before or seen in the news or, or things like that. Okay, so one is password policies, right? So if you go to a website, you register for the website, uh, the site might implement a policy for what password it will accept. So it might force you to use one capital character at least, one lowercase character at least, one digit and one special character, for example, right? It might force you to have at least eight characters, okay? Um, so some of these uh, policies are based on the estimated strength of your password, and the idea is that a more complex password is harder to guess. That's not strictly true, right? Uh, so if these are randomly generated passwords, then choosing from just lowercase letters, right? Let's say I'm going to choose an eight character password at random. If I take each character and I expand it from the set of lowercase letters to the set of lowercase plus uppercase plus special characters, then indeed that makes the password stronger, okay? It makes the number of combinations grow. Um, like I said, it's better to add characters than to add to the alphabet size. Uh, because of exponential growth, um, but but anyways, you you do get uh, you do get an increase in the complexity of the password. Okay, so sometimes that mentality is applied to human chosen passwords, uh, but it, it doesn't necessarily correlate uh, uh, with it. it. It could be that people are still choosing a subset of passwords uh, that are easy to guess, even though they involve these special characters, because they're doing simple tricks like replacing capital E with the number three or just adding an exclamation mark on the end of, of their password or whatever the case may be, okay? Another approach that's much better is you can look at, hey, what are the passwords that we know about, right? Uh, so you can, uh, so a lot of them have been leaked, sometimes in raw plain text form, so you actually know the passwords. Sometimes they're leaked in hashed form, uh, and so you would have to build a rainbow table, and so you might not know all of the passwords that were involved in a particular leak, but you know the ones that you could crack anyways. Uh, and so a password policy could be, hey, we've seen that password in a leak, so we're not going to let you use it, okay? Um, so for example, I use a password manager. I use Apple's built-in password manager, and that's one thing it does. Uh, so if I open up my list of passwords, it marks a whole bunch of passwords that have shown up in leak databases for me. Uh, another thing it will do is it will show me all the passwords that I use, reuse across multiple sites and it'll say, oh, you should, you should choose a unique one. And then if I let it, it will replace it with a randomly selected password. So that's not a website policy, that's just a feature of, of, of the password manager. Uh, privacy policies is another thing uh, you've probably seen. Uh, so this is sort of related to terms of service and things like that, all that like kind of legalese uh, that you tend to see. So when you go to a website, it will tell you, uh, you know, the information that it will collect about you uh, and different things like that. 
Um, another, another incident uh, that was interesting is that uh, Facebook decided at one point to turn on two-factor authentication. Uh, and the way they did it was over SMS. So they would send you a text message. Now in order for you to uh, turn on two-factor authentication, you have to provide a valid phone number. They'll test it right away. So right when you put the phone number in, they're going to send a code to it and they won't let you register that uh, unless if you can answer that code right away. So they're validating that it's at least some sort of valid phone number that you have access to, okay? And this is done in the name of security, right? Now the problem is that Facebook then there's evidence to show that they turned around and they monetize that data because now they have phone numbers for everyone, right? Uh, and so they have some personal information and uh, maybe they can better correlate your, your information uh, that they have about you uh, with other data sources they have where they might just have your phone number showing up in the database. Uh, we're, not, we're not sure all the things they did. Uh, phone numbers tend to, to give some sense of uh, geolocation uh, because there's an area code uh, now, Facebook might have that already from, you know, your IP address or even the data that you volunteer uh, when you log in. Um, but anyways, uh, so the point was that they implemented this policy, a, a change in a password policy, but it ended up being a privacy violation in, in other ways. Okay, so that's also a sort of abuse of, of policy. Uh, recently, Apple introduced a uh, software feature in their operating system. I'm not sure the current status of it. I think there was maybe enough pushback that they didn't actually go through with it. I, I need to double check it. But the proposal was that every time you take a picture, what they would do is they would analyze it client side on your phone and they're looking for things like child pornography. And so now AI and machine learning are, they, the tools, the classification tools are, they feel strong enough that they could rec recognize it. Uh, and then your phone will basically um, I, I forget what it did. It will somehow notify law enforcement. So I don't know if it notifies it with a copy of the picture or if it just sends a message. I, I don't forget all of the, I forget some of the details of it. Okay, so that's a policy. Um, it was criticized because, well, one news story was someone uh, took a picture of their own son who was sick and they were sending it to the doctor, right? And it had some nudity in it and then it was flagged uh, as a result of this. Um, and so, and then other people consider it a privacy violation. And I'm not here to tell you whether it's good or bad. I mean, it sort of has to do with how you want to balance uh, law enforcement, you know, with, with privacy. But anyway, so that's an example of a policy that could be decided uh, about, about the data that's on your phone. Uh, another simple thing uh, that, that people do is uh, when you set up a website, for example, let's say you have a bunch of customers and you're gonna do e-billing, so you're gonna send them an email with their bill. And so if you look at the URL of the bill, uh, basically it says, you know, what the name of the hydro company, for example, and then like view bill, and then there'll be a number. And so you might be bill uh, 3117, okay? Uh, now, if you were to change that URL to 3118, right, if, the only secret about that message is the URL itself. So they send that URL to you. You don't have to log in or anything like that. Anyone who goes to that exact URL is authorized to view the bill. That would be a policy that a website might change, or sorry, might, might choose for itself. Then if you were to increment that bill number, then you might see someone else's bill. And you could increment it again and you could find someone else's bill, okay? And so it seems like a, a pretty uh, simple thing to avoid. Okay, but this type of attack was, was very prevalent uh, maybe five years ago, as, as recently as five years ago, 10 years ago. People went to jail for just doing this, essentially. Uh, so they would uh, just increment. They, they arguably built a script that would automatically fetch URLs within a certain range. Uh, and so I, th I think the legal case sort of turned on the fact that they automated it, um, but, but anyways. So, 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 for example, this is an example where a URL might look like this, and then you could change that 741 to, to 742. Um, there's also examples that are cited of, uh, like, if you use a cloud uh, service provider, uh, what they do is they are going to store your data or run your processes on a machine. 
right? It's going to go on a physical server. Uh, that server is going to be co-located, or sorry, other, other users will have their data and their processes running on the same server, okay? And so those should be contained, right? Uh, they usually would set up uh, different virtual machines uh, for every user, and then they would rely on the VM software to provide containment so that uh, if my processes happens to be running on the same physical server as yours, there's no way I should be able to access what's in RAM on when your processes are running or what data is being stored uh, to the hard drive when, when you're running and things like that, okay? Uh, so there were some examples in the earlier days of, of cloud uh, hosting where uh, when you wrote things to the operating system to disk, uh, you didn't set the file permissions specific to that, uh, to that process uh, or to that user anyway. So basically the files weren't contained and so you could just go and read other files that happen to be on the same physical machine as you even though they belong to other users. Another thing you might have heard about in the news is called swatting. Uh, so swatting is where um, somebody figures out your physical location, uh, an adversary figures out like your address, for example, and then what they'll do is they'll uh, call law enforcement like 911. Uh, they'll pretend that there's an emergency uh, and uh, one of a serious nature that would require the police to intervene quickly and with force, right? So they may describe a scenario where someone's being uh, assaulted or murdered or something like that. And so when the police show up, it's not just a knock on the door, it's they come in uh, what's called SWAT, right? Which is the police in sort of the military garb. And uh, they come, they kick down the door, uh, they have their guns drawn. And uh, people have died as a result of this because the police will accidentally shoot someone uh, as a result of it. Okay, um, so this is also an abuse of a policy or procedure, which is from law enforcement's perspective, they receive a call, right? How are they supposed to know whether it's real or not, right? Uh, and let's say it is a real crime that's being committed and they don't act, you know, with full force, then they'll be criticized for that, right? And so they're sort of stuck uh, not knowing how to react uh, to, to, to these calls when they come in. So anyway, so establish a policy or procedure uh, for, for how they'll conduct themselves when these types of calls come in. And that's probably changed uh, as a result of swatting. Um, another thing is uh, Apple has uh, these uh, air tags. Uh, I can show you one actually. So you've probably seen them. There, there was earlier technology called Tile uh, that did the same type of thing. Uh, but basically it's like a little RFID tag and uh, you put it on your keys or whatever and then if you lose your keys, uh, then you can try and track it. Now, normally what this will do is it will talk to my phone, right? So that's the way Tile worked is, is the tag is configured to talk to my phone and if my phone and the tag end up in different locations, right, then my phone knows that it's not in proximity but it doesn't know where it is. What Apple said is, hey, instead of that, we can do better. Uh, there's a lot of people carrying around iPhones. So if I leave my keys here and my phone goes with me, my phone can no longer talk to my tag, but if anyone else in the room has an iPhone, their phone could geolocate my tag for me and sort of through your phones, it could send me a message of where my tag is, essentially, right? Um, so, so, so that was the idea uh, for it. Now, one of the problems uh, with this is uh, it's very easy to stalk someone, right? So what people will do is they might, for example, stick one on your car, right? If they wanna know where you live and then you drive home and then they follow it. Uh, or they might put it on your person or, or whatever the case may be. It uh, isn't necessarily not someone like that you don't know a stranger. It could be uh, like someone in your life, like a family member or someone you're in a relationship with. Uh, that are also like sticking it surreptitiously uh, into your um, whatever, your bag, your purse, your clothes, uh, and then it uh, is able to track you, okay? So then what Apple said is, so initially they, they just released it and uh, there was enough complaints about its ability to enable stocking uh, that Apple said, okay, we're going to change our policy. Um, and so now what we're going to do is we're going to see if, I'm carrying my phone, 
and I'm carrying my AirTag, sorry, and an AirTag is going along with me. And basically, everywhere my phone goes, an AirTag is also going with it, but that AirTag is not registered to me, okay? So it's someone else's AirTag. Then you'll get a pop-up uh, on your phone uh, basically saying, you can read it, AirTag found moving with you, the location of this AirTag can be seen by the owner, and then if you click on it, you get a longer message uh, safety alert, uh, first seen with you at some time, 6.20 a.m. Uh, your current location can be seen by the owner of this AirTag. This AirTag may be attached to an item you're borrowing. If this AirTag is not familiar to you, you can disable it and stop sharing your location. Okay, so you're actually able to also, um, also disable it as well, okay? So this is a change in policy. It's a, a shift in policy to try and address this attack. Whether this is adequate or not, that's also open to debate, but it's certainly better than nothing. Okay, uh, so there's a, a paper I read recently uh, from uh, some people at Princeton uh, that, that's really nice, and, and they also point out the fact that there's not a lot of research uh, in the area of policies, and uh, some of the examples from the quick examples from the previous one, like the uh, VM co-location uh, for, for cloud data, and maybe another one was I took from the paper, uh, but they, they do a, a longer study uh, and uh, the, the main results uh, concerns uh, SIM swapping, okay? Um, so SIM swapping is where you, uh, well, I, I write it as you ask for a change of a phone number, but it's, it's maybe a little bit more involved than that. So, so essentially what happens is when I call you, right, I type a phone number into my phone, okay? Now your, you have that phone that corresponds to that phone number, but that phone number is not actually in your phone per se, okay? So like, it's not like that phone number is a unique identifier of your phone. So for example, if you lose your phone, it's still possible to get a new phone and to attach that phone number to your new phone, okay? So the, the phone number is not inherent uh, to, to your phone, to your actual hardware, okay? So how does that work? So what is inherent, what's unique about your phone is it has what's called a SIM number, okay? So all phones have SIM numbers, unique SIM numbers. And what your, your, who you pay your phone bill to, so Bell, for example, what they do is they basically map a phone number to a SIM number, okay? So if I, when I call you, it first gets routed to Bell, and Bell says, okay, I know this phone number, it's this SIM number, then it gets routed through the phone network to your actual hardware because your hardware is the hardware that has that SIM number. Okay, um, so if I lose my phone, that's fine. I get a new phone. I now have a new SIM number, so it's not like I'll automatically get my calls, but I'll call up Bell and I'll say, hey, uh, I have a new SIM number. Can you, you know, can you patch my old phone number over to this new SIM number, okay? Uh, and then if they do it, then all your calls will be routed to this new device and they will no longer be routed to the old device, okay? So this is a vector for attack, right? So if I wanna, take over your phone number. It basically involves me trying to convince Bell that I'm you. And once I convince them that, you're, that I'm you, it's not that unusual for people to change the phone number associated with the SIM number. That, that happens all the time. People are always like losing things and, and stuff like that. And sometimes people, you know, like maybe you, you're, you're touring or you're visiting somewhere international. So you're taking your SIM card out, you're putting a new SIM card in, you just lose the card, not the phone. Right, so, so it's not so uncommon that, that uh, people make this request. It's not like an unusual thing. Um, so what they did is they basically tried kind of like a social engineering attack, although it wasn't premised on pretexting necessarily. It was more premised just on what's the policy that the phone companies have uh, for what kind of information they, they need to identify you, okay? And so they tried it uh, 50 times. I think this was on 50 different uh, companies, I, I forget. And anyways, it worked on, they were able to get it to work on 39. They only attacked their own phone. So they, they called up and, and uh, but they only used the information that an adversary might know. So like, for example, uh, one, one thing was, okay, you, you, you say you're this person, what are the last three calls that you received? Okay, now why is that a bad policy? 
So the person who actually owns the phone, they will know the last three calls they received, right? The adversary won't necessarily because they haven't taken over the phone yet. Okay, so exactly. So the adversary just calls them three times. Now they know what the last three calls were, okay? So it's actually almost exactly the same attack as, as in at mat, where I don't know some information, so I'm the one that adds the information to the account, and now I know it. So you can call the number. You can use several different phone numbers or, or maybe use the same one, and now you know it. And so um, what, what we sometimes think about is uh, if I'm trying to figure out whether you are who you say you are, and I have some account details, and so your knowledge of your account details is what I'm using to authenticate you, you have to think about are these details things that only you could have added or that are under your control? Or are they things that other people could add or are under adversarial control? Okay, so the list of credit cards in Amazon's old policy is under adversarial control because anyone can call up and add a credit card to any account, essentially, with very minimal information, right? Uh, the set of uh, phone numbers that have recently called you, that's also adversarially controlled uh, because the adversary can call those numbers. Okay, so it's not something that's strictly under the user's control. Um, and then they, they also look at uh, SIM recycling. So sometimes uh, uh, numbers are, are recycled. Uh, and so when you get a new number, you might uh, be able to access, for example, you could go around to accounts and uh, try and access them. Uh, based on, on the fact that that phone number is still registered with the account and now the messages are uh, being directed to you, okay? Um, so why would you want to take over someone's phone number? Uh, the answer is that uh, that usually has to do with authentication, okay? So it's either two-factor authentication. You still need the password, but maybe you know the password or the password is easy to crack, but two-factor is set up and it's SMS-based. So if you can do a SIM swap on top of it, then you can get access to the account. Uh, sometimes with password recovery, uh, it could just be your phone number, right? Just being able to receive uh, a text message to that phone number that's set up as a recovery phone number, that's enough to reset the password. So in that case, you wouldn't need the password and the phone, you would just need the phone. And so if you wanna look, there's tons and tons of uh, examples of this. I do a lot of work in blockchain and cryptocurrencies, and so uh, there were, there's lots of people who have gotten their Bitcoin stolen uh, because it was sitting on a central exchange, and that central exchange had like a phone-based recovery, right? And so if you have millions of dollars that are sitting there, that's a big incentive uh, for adversaries to attack. Uh, and so if it just comes down to a sim, sim swap, uh, they'll, they'll probably find a way to do it. This is another thing that I saw in the news just uh, maybe a month ago. Um, and so uh, this has to do with, uh, po it's basically like SIM swapping, but it's for, uh, for postal mail. Um, so uh, USPS in the headline is uh, the United States Postal Service. And so it says the life up ending flaw that the United States Postal Service won't fix. Um, and basically what it comes down to is that anybody can send or sorry, can request a change of address. So let's say you move and you want all your mail forwarded from your old address to a new address, uh, then you're able to submit that request, okay? Uh, and you don't have to show ID or anything like that. And there might, there might be some variants, uh, but, but anyways, this is true in enough locations uh, that, that, that this attack is being used. Now, they won't just accept it blindly. They won't say, okay, okay, you, you say that you're Jeremy Clark, I, I believe you, okay? So what they do is their policy is, okay, we're going to try and figure out whether this is valid or not, okay? So the policy isn't require an ID, and if that person's not Jeremy Clark, then, then don't accept their, their driver's license doesn't show the same address that they're requesting an address change for, uh, don't accept it. Their policy is a little different. So their policy is that we're going to send two postcards. Uh, one will go to the old address, and one will go to the new address. And it will basically say, hey, we're about to implement this mail forwarding. Uh, if you don't like it, then you know, here's a phone number or, or something or a website, and you can go and you can cancel it. Okay? Now, 
the one that's being sent, let's say I'm an adversary and so I'm doing this as an attack, okay? So I want your mail coming to my address, okay? So the new address I control, right? So the fact that they send the postcard there doesn't matter, okay? This is more like if I want to spam you so I route someone who gets a lot of mail to your account or something like that. So that's, that's why they would send it to the new address. But the critical one is the, the one to the old address, okay? So that will go to you and if you uh, respond to it, uh, then that's then you can stop this attack from happening. Okay, so the, there is a policy in place uh, that's meant to uh, prevent this, but it's arguably maybe not the best policy. Okay, so what we do is we call this policy uh, allow override. Okay, allow override means that uh, if no action is taken, then uh, the, the change is basically implemented. Okay. So what we do is we send the postcard, and if we don't hear anything, we assume it's okay, okay? So not hearing anything contrary, we assume it's okay, and then we proceed, okay? Have we seen this before? Anyone remember where we've seen this? This type of allow override policy? Yeah, exactly. So uh, remember in revocation, right, your browser is gonna check whether a certificate has been revoked or not. And if it doesn't hear anything, it's going to assume that the certificate is fine, okay? Now, the, the opposite of it would be, okay, okay, so what's the attack? So the attack is, well, you basically have to stop that postcard from getting to the person, or you can hope that if they receive it, they just don't know what to do with it, or they forget, or something like that, or they don't think it's important, right? So probably these things might get lost, or people might not respond correctly or they might think oh this is a mistake and just ignore it or something like that so there's probably a certain success rate even if you don't try and do anything okay but if I really care about it and I'm worried about it uh, then what I'll do is I'll try and intercept it right so I'll walk by your house I'll watch for the post person they go to your house that's fine I wait five minutes and then if you haven't checked your mail by then I just go and, and take it out of your mailbox and, and I'm gone um, so uh, yeah, so, so that attack. So what you could do instead is um, uh, the alternative uh, would be a deny override. So a deny override would say, I'm gonna send the postcard and there's gonna be a link on it and if you want this change, you have to do it. If I don't hear anything from you, then I'm gonna cancel it, okay? So when I don't hear anything, I'm gonna assume I'm not gonna take, I'm not gonna make the change. Okay, so I won't make the change until I get some positive action from you, okay? Still not a perfect policy because if I'm able to intercept it, then I'm able to uh, click on the link myself and, and make it go through, okay? So it's not perfect, but it's better than a, a, an allow override because if it's lost or the person doesn't know what to do with it or they forget about it or whatever the case may be like that, any of those types of faults happen then the change doesn't actually take place okay at the same time it still allows legitimate use cases so a legitimate use case would be uh, that you actually want to change your address then that's fine you just wait for the postcard and then and then you send it um, so this article had one sort of uh, uh, example that I thought was kind of funny um, so it says in a particularly comical case from 2017 an Atlanta resident was arrested for cashing checks that he had rerouted from the corporate headquarters of the shipping giant UPS. Uh, this resulted in literal bathtubs full of mail piling, outs piling up outside the haps hapless fraudster's apartment. Yet it still took nearly three months for UPS to notice that its mail wasn't showing up. So basically he re rerouted like the corporate headquarters of UPS, their mail to his personal apartment and he wasn't prepared for the large volume of mail that he was receiving, so he had a bathtub full of, of, of letters. And, uh, but then he started cashing uh, some of the checks uh, that he received, and then, and then they eventually caught him. Um, but yeah, it, it took them three months before they even no noticed that their mail was missing. Okay, so, so the, the improvement you can do is you can, uh, you can do the ID check uh, with, with an address. So that's what the people are advocating uh, and that might actually be the change that's made. And then uh, you could try a deny override approach where uh, you still send the postcards, but in this case you have to you know, type a code or something that's printed on it into a website in order to authorize the change. Okay, so the next thing we'll talk about is airport 
uh, security. So everyone in the room, I'm assuming, has flown uh, sometime in your life. And uh, so you've all gone through the security process at the airport. And it's pretty long and involved, and it actually involves a lot of different policies about different things. Um, so we'll, we'll go through kind of each stage uh, one by one. So what's the first step where some security happens in the airport? So, or, or just with flights in general. So when we say security in an airport, that we usually mean like, you know, where you go through the metal detectors or whatever, we call that security, okay? But security actually starts before you ever get to the metal detector. So where, where's the first point, point that it might start? Okay, uh, any, anyone, anything earlier? Okay, okay, so even when you just buy the ticket in the first place, uh, that's, that's actually kind of the first step. All right, so what I might do is I might go to whatever, Air Canada, or I might go to Expedia, and I'll, whatever, I'll look for the flights, I'll find one, and then I'll, I'll book my ticket. And, uh, okay, so the first question, I, I guess the answer is already on the screen, but if I buy a ticket, can I give it to you? No, you can't, right? Okay, so tickets, if I buy a concert ticket, can I give it to you? Sure, more or less. I mean, there, maybe it's, it's a little harder to do now. There might be a form of transfer thing. But yeah, flights don't work that way, okay? So with flights, you book it, you book it under a name. Your ID is tied to that ticket. It's only redeemable by you. Uh, you, can't, you can't give it uh, to someone else, okay? And do you have to show identity to book, book a ticket? Okay, you, you might have to assert what your identity is, okay? But you don't have to show, no one's going to look at your passport, look at the face on the passport and compare it to your face when you book a ticket. Agreed? Okay, so, so because you can book it online, uh, that's, that's obvious, okay? So a typical interaction might be that you send your identify, you tell them your name that you want to book the ticket under, uh, you send your money to Expedia, Expedia will turn around, forward it to Air Canada, and then you'll get a confirmation uh, that comes back. Okay, now meantime, what's happening in the background is what Air Canada is doing is they're taking your identity and they're forwarding it to, for example, the government of Canada. And the government of Canada has a no-fly list. Okay, so people who are not allowed to fly. And this is why you can't transfer tickets uh, between people, okay? Because they're checking your identity against the no-fly list. If, if you got a ticket from someone else and you were on the no-fly list, then, then that identity check might not happen, okay? Um, so, so your uh, ticket is tied strictly uh, to the no-fly list. Uh, and then the government will get back to Air Canada. Uh, not in, this is not an instant like process, okay? This is something that might take a couple days. Uh, and so Air Canada will, will basically, at some point, uh, after you booked your ticket, but before you actually try and board, they'll learn about whether you're, um, you'll be allowed or denied. Okay, so once you book your ticket, uh, you're given, you've probably seen it before, you've probably used it before, uh, what's called a booking code, right? So this is like a four uh, kind of digit number, okay? Now, what you don't realize necessarily is that that booking code is kind of like a password for your flight, okay? So if I know what your booking code is, and generally I might need your last name. Maybe I'll have to know which airline you're flying at, but, the, but these codes usually would have that encoded in them anyways. Uh, then I could do all sorts of things, right? Um, so uh, for example, I could just log in and then I could see probably your full name. I could maybe see your passport information, could maybe get your address. There's all sorts of information that would just be displayed uh, that because now it's I'm in your profile say on Air Canada, uh, what I could do is I could cancel your flight either to be a jerk or maybe I want to uh, book it for credit. So I'll, I'll add my frequent flyer or my Air Canada like account number to your account and then I'll cancel your flight and then I'll take the credits and then I'll book my own flight with it or spend it some other, how, some other way. Uh, if, if I notice you don't have a frequent flyer plan, maybe I just log in and then I uh, just add mine to your account and then I log back out, I leave everything else. And if you weren't planning on adding your frequent flyer uh, account to it anyways, then I'll collect your points, 
you won't even know about it. And if I do this to 10,000 accounts, I'm going to be rich, right, at the end of the day. Um, so, so anyway, so these, these are all sorts of things that you uh, can do. Okay, so knowing this, this is more or less like a password, right? So you should keep it secret, right? You shouldn't go around showing people what these things are, okay? The problem is that people do it all the time, right? They post on Twitter, they're really excited because, or Instagram or whatever, uh, TikTok, uh, that they're really excited that they're gonna fly home, so they post a picture of their, uh, their ticket or their boarding pass. Guess what? That code is right there on the boarding pass, right? Uh, um, I, I should say uh, one other thing is, is that when I log in and do this stuff, it's not like I'm going to a person and, or calling someone up. Like it's just a website, right? So I just type in the information and then I can make all of these adjustments. So it's not even like a spoofing social engineering attack. It's just uh, something I can do with a web interface. Okay, um, yeah, and then basically every piece of like, uh, every like tag that you get from the airport, like the things that you put on your luggage, uh, you know, your boarding pass, whatever, that code is printed on it somewhere, okay? It might be in a QR code or something like that. You might not be able to see it, but it's basically there. It's what's sort of tying, it's sort of the tracking information for your flight, okay? So if I'm in line behind you and you have your suitcase and you're, you're about to check it and you have your luggage tag, you know, on your bag, right? I just take a picture of the tag as I walk by. Now I know your code. I can change all of your information. Your, your last name's probably printed on it as well, right? It's, it's certainly if you're holding your boarding pass in your hand or something like that, walk by, take a picture of it, uh, then uh, I'm gonna get your last name and I'm gonna get your, um, your PNR. And uh, even if I want to just brute force it, like I wanna guess all PNRs, first off, six, it's, it's six characters, so that's not huge, right? Like you would never set a six character password, right? Uh, and then it turns out it's not even fully random. So, so like different airlines will get like, like every code that starts with this letter is for this airline and things like that. So there's some structure that's built into these codes. These codes are a little different and, and different airlines will, will assign them in different ways and things like that. And it might depend on the country and things like that. So the, this, your mileage might vary on this, but, uh, but in a lot of places, uh, these codes will have some structure to it. So even if you were to brute force it, uh, then you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't have to like, do a full dictionary attack on it uh, or exhaustive search attack. Uh, you, could, you could exploit the, the structure. Okay, so we've purchased our ticket. So that's great. What's the next step? What do we do next? Okay, so we're going to go to the airport and we're going to check in, okay? Do, do, do we actually have to get to the airport before we check in? Okay, okay, okay. So the next step will be the check-in. And so this is either going to happen at the airport or uh, we could do it before we get to the airport. Um, and so the, there's basically three main ways uh, that you might do it. Um, so you might wait till you're at the airport. You might walk up to a counter uh, and talk to a human being. Uh, in this case, they will generally ask for your passport. They'll check your passport against your face, uh, and then they'll give you your boarding pass, and they will um, uh, give you your luggage tags as well if, if you want to check luggage. Okay. Uh, you can do a kiosk. Uh, so a kiosk is the the computer or terminal. Uh, so with a kiosk, generally what they'll, they generally ask for your passport, uh, but they won't match it against your face. Okay. The most sophisticated thing they could do is take a picture of your face, take a picture of your passport, and then either someone later is going to verify that or maybe they try and use machine learning or something like that to, to, to try and verify it. And maybe if they can't validate it, they might send you to a human or something like that. But anyways, in Canada, uh, if you fly Air Canada or something like that, they, they, they usually ask for a scan of your passport, but they don't ever check it against your face. They don't take a picture of you or anything like that. Okay. So essentially, there's no ID check. And uh, if you do it online, once again, you, you would normally put your passport details into the app that you're using, uh, but that's it, okay? So there's, there's definitely no ID check. And if you don't have checked baggage, then you can just walk right through this whole process without ever talking to a human being, okay? Now, 
this is where the no-fly list uh, kicks in. So let's say that it turns out that you're not, you are on the, the, the no-fly list, uh, so you're not allowed to fly. Uh, you won't necessarily know about it. I, I believe, I, I don't know all the, the inner details, but the stories that have been reported in the media are people don't know about it until they show up at the airport, okay? So it's conceivable that, that when you book the ticket and the airline learns of it, they could try and notify you ahead of time. Uh, but often what will happen is you'll show up at the airport, uh, you'll do the check-in, and it will say, uh, uh, it won't say, sorry, you're on the no-fly list. It will say, sorry, there's something wrong with your thing. You have to go to the counter, right, to the human. And then when you show up at the counter, then you'll get the, the real story about, about why this is, okay? Um, now, the no-fly list is based on name, it seems, okay, uh, as opposed to, to, to other things. So what if you have the same name as someone that's on the no-fly list? You're not the same person, but you have the same name. What happens? Okay, so you, you could get flagged. So it happens all the time. Uh, and it happens a lot to like kids that might be three years old or four years old. And uh, they just happen to have a name that's on the no-fly list. And guess what? They show up at the airport and they can't fly uh, as a result. So this is, for example, one of the kids who was, uh, it's happened to him over and over and over. So every couple of years, he's in the news again. Uh, because uh, another thing about the no-fly list is once you're on it, it's really hard to get an exemption uh, for it. And there's a lot of secrecy around it. And you don't know who's on the list ahead of time. You don't know whether you're on it or not. You don't even really know where in the government you go. There's no like email address to email to say that there's a problem or anything like that. So it's uh, very much cloaked in secrecy. So there was, uh, the, the other screenshot is just uh, an organization that's trying to do some reform uh, uh, for this uh, in terms of, um, uh, in terms of trying to increase transparency around uh, no-fly lists. Um, and so, yeah, so the, the uh, one, one article that came out in The Guardian a, a while ago says uh, that Canada uses a system called TuScan. Uh, it's a vast re repository of at least uh, 680,000 names. 40% uh, have no recognized terrorist group affiliation. Uh, adding a name can be as simple as filling out a form. So this is also where, so policies apply to uh, whether you match the list. If it's based just on your name, that's also a policy decision, right? I decide that, that name is going to be the thing uh, that does it. Then you might think of, well, where does the list come from? So there's going to be policies around mm -hmm. it. And so what you see is that it's easy to add to the list, but once a name's on the list, it's really hard to get it off, okay? So the policy makes it easy for the list to expand. Uh, so you can just fill out a form, not you, but like someone who works in law enforcement or intelligence or, or something like that. Uh, they could just fill out a form and basically it would be added to the list. And then if you wanna get it taken off, there's no one you can contact. Uh, essentially you have to sue the government and then uh, then the court system will, uh, like they'll find the right person, right? Once it goes to court, then the government's obliged to you know, bring the right people to court and things like that. And, and then you could, uh, you could actually get a name eliminated or an exemption for someone who, they don't necessarily take the name off, but they say, well, here's this one person who has the same name. They have a password. Let's use their password number and their name uh, to, to ensure that they're not the, the right person. Uh, it's been really successful according to the news article. And it also says that because Canada's using a US-based list, uh, we can ask the U.S. to take a name off, but they won't necessarily do it. All right. Uh, then the next thing we do uh, is, uh, let's say we're successful. So we're, we're not on the no-fly list, whether, you know, because we sh actually should be on the list or we shouldn't be on the list. Uh, so what do we do? We get a boarding pass, right? Okay. So you get your boarding pass. Uh, it has a bunch of information on it. Uh, some of the information on it might be your last name, right? And it might be your confirmation code, that six-digit code that we talked about. So if you don't protect those two pieces of information uh, when you're carrying your boarding pass around or want to put it on social media, uh, then someone could change your flight, okay? So that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, and uh, basically what the purpose of the boarding pass is, it's kind of like a ticket 
but it's not used as a ticket. Like eventually when you show it, it's not like, oh, I see what's on the boarding pass, therefore I believe it. It's more like a hook into a database, right? So there's some computer system that has all of the information and the boarding pass is like when you scan it, it pulls up your file or your record uh, with all the information on it, okay? Um, but there's other stuff that could go on uh, the boarding pass as well. So for example, uh, there's the seat uh, that's assigned to you. Um, there's uh, that TSA pre-check. So this is an American thing, but does anyone know what that is? So this means that you're pre-approved for security. And so when you go through the security process of having uh, yourself scanned and your possession scanned, you get to go to a different security line. It's usually shorter, there's maybe less scrutiny and things like that uh, with it. Uh, there's the boarding group, what's that? Okay, okay, it's, yeah, yeah, so it's, it's arrangement on the plane. How does it impact you? I mean, do you want boarding group one or do you want boarding group six? You want one, why? Okay, because you want to get on the flight early or whatever. Okay, so if, if the lower the number is, uh, yeah, that type of thing, okay? Now, we can think, I said that this is just a hook into a database, okay? That's not entirely true, okay? Some of the stuff on the boarding pass is a hook into a database and some of it is what we call a bearer token meaning I believe it because I see it on the boarding pass itself okay so for example the seat number that's a hook into the database so you know maybe when you go on the plane if you have a boarding pass and it says that you're in 10a right they're not going to just let you sit in 10a necessarily okay so if they if their flight records are showing a different seat then you're going to sit in the other seat okay but when you ask what line should I go to and you have TSA pre on your boarding pass, then they'll direct you to the line. They're not going to scan it and make sure that that's what's in the database, okay? It's just because of what's on the boarding pass. That's, that's why uh, that decision is made. Same with the boarding group, right? Uh, when you show up and, and you're supposed to be in the right boarding group or whatever, it's just, well, that's what's on your boarding pass. Uh, so, some, so, so, so the stuff that is like that, it's human readable because uh, someone has to look at it and make a decision on it. Other stuff is encoded in QR codes and that's a hook into a database system. Okay. Uh, what if I want to change my boarding pass? Let's say I don't like being in boarding group four, so I just change it to a one. And then I print out a new boarding pass, whatever, I Photoshop it. Or I take that TSA pre logo, I know how it looks. I Photoshop it on a new boarding pass, right? Are boarding passes, first off, are they printed on some special paper? Is it like currency where you can't forge it? So maybe it used to be, uh, but, but I mean, that, everything that's on it could be spoofed. But now with the kiosk, you just get like this super thin like receipt paper that just gets printed out. And you can also have it on your phone, so you might not even have it physically, okay? So you might just have a picture on your phone, right? And so there's absolutely no document level authentication on a boarding pass. What about the details themselves? Are they like, I don't know, digitally signed or something like that? Uh, so that, that if you manipulate it, it won't match what's in the QR code, for example. So they do have a QR code, but you can, I mean, you can get a QR code reader. So you don't necessarily know the answer to it. Uh, but the answer, it turns out, is no. There's no message integrity at all, okay? So all the details can be spoofed, okay? You're not going to be able to change any database, right? So if this is a hook into a database, you won't be able to change the database itself. But everything that's on a boarding pass, you can change if you want, okay? And there's no way to get caught unless if it gets compared to the database, okay? That's basically the only way uh, to get caught, okay? So anyone that's not scanning it in order to uh, realize something, uh, they're just looking at what's printed on it, then they're just going to believe it based on what's printed on it, okay? And even the database, it hooks into a database. The database is controlled usually by the airline. So if it's someone from Air Canada and they're scanning it, then they can see Air Canada's database. But if it's 
someone else, like a security agent or someone like that, and they're scanning it, they won't necessarily have access to that database, okay? So uh, the QR code might encode the same information that's printed on it, but you could change the QR code to match whatever you wanted uh, that's printed on it, okay? So there's some limits to what you can do with this, but if you want to, you could forge, you know, going to a lower priority security line, you could forge things like your boarding group. Uh, you could forge your seat, but like I said, the seat will be assigned by the airline da database. And so when someone else is sitting on your seat and two people have a boarding pass with the same seat printed on it, then they're gonna go to, to the database or to a flight record uh, and, and, and you'll end up in your, your original seat. So you, you can try it, but it, it's not gonna get you what you want. Now you might say, well, why don't we digitally sign it? Right, that makes sense. And the answer basically is the same answer we saw with SSL and HTTPS, which is that it's really hard to know what people's public keys are, right? What's Air Canada's public key? Uh, is it always the same? And then also you have to do the actual signing itself, right? So then Air Canada has to have a server up somewhere and every time a boarding pass is generated, they would have to sign it. So if I change my seat, I walk up to the kiosk and they're like, select your seat and I change it. Well, that has to get signed because it's now a new boarding pass with new information. So that means what, the keys on the kiosk? That seems really dangerous, right? Or the kiosk is connected to the internet and it's phoning some server. And then think about that server that Airline Air Canada has up. If it ever goes down or the kiosk doesn't have an internet connection or something like that, uh, then you can't get that signature back on time, right? Like the whole thing's a mess, right? So digital signing, uh, PKI, the distribution of public keys, tying it to identities, and then dealing with revocation and being able to, to get things, like having a hot server with the key on it. Either you're giving the key to everyone, then it's going to get stolen, or everyone has to talk to a server, then everyone has to be online. I mean, you can just think of a million ways it's going to fail, okay? So the, 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 the answer at the end of the day is we don't do uh, message integrity because it's, it's too hard to manage the keys. Okay, so we have our boarding pass. We're not on the no-fly list, uh, so that's good. What do we do next? Are we finally at, at security, quote-unquote? Say loud. Yeah, so physical security, metal detectors, all that stuff. Is there anything that happens before? Okay, so one thing we might say is we've we got to check our bags if, if we have them. So maybe we're carrying baggages on, but if, if we have bags, we can think about that. So. Uh, we'll check our baggage. Okay, so uh, first off, every bag is tagged, right? Uh, so, so you'll go, you'll get a tag with it. You're not allowed to leave your bag unattended, right? Uh, and so every bag is either with someone or it's tagged as to the person that it belongs to. Uh, from a legal perspective in most countries, you're, you are responsible for what's in your bag. So if you drop a bag off and it gets tagged with your name, you can't say, well, someone else packed that bag. I didn't know what was in it, I didn't look. Doesn't matter, you're, you're legally responsible uh, for, for what's, whatever is in your bag, okay? So you take your bag, you tag it, that's fine, and then you, uh, you drop it off, it goes away on a conveyor belt, okay? Then you see it again when you land, hopefully, right? That's where you might want an air tag. Uh, hopefully it's there waiting for you uh, when you land on the other side. Now, does anything happen to your bag in between? Does it just get carried onto your plane? Or is there some sort of inspection? Or, or what do you think happens behind the scenes? Okay, so the answer is 100% there's inspection uh, that's, that's going to happen, okay? Um, so who's doing the inspection? It's not the airline itself. It's basically law enforcement, and it's not uh, specifically law enforcement per se, like for example in, in Quebec it wouldn't be uh, the Quebec police, it wouldn't be the RCMP, uh, it's going to be a special uh, division of law enforcement uh, that basically they're in charge of airport security, that's their mandate. So they work for the, the, well they work for the government organization, so it's called the CATSA in Canada, in the US it's called just the TSA, I'm sure you've heard the TSA. Uh, and so they're, they're going to look at your bags. And then if you're crossing a border, so let's say you're coming from somewhere out of Canada back into Canada or to Canada for the first time, 
then you also have border services, okay? And so they may also inspect your bag. Um, so uh, CA, TSA are mainly concerned about the safety of the flight itself, okay? So if there's a bomb in your bag, that's what they're looking for. Border services are more concerned with what you're bringing into the country, okay? So if there's drugs in your bag, then that's more of a border service kind of thing, okay? Obviously, if there's anything illegal, period, in your bag, everyone's interested in it, including law enforcement. But CATSA are, are really, they're there for the safety of the flight and, and border services are, are more there for like, why, why are you coming into the country and are you permitted to and things like that. Okay, so behind the scenes, there's a very elaborate uh, system uh, and so everything's automated. So there's conveyor belts and then it sort of shuffles the bags and they go through x-rays. Uh, if there's something suspicious or if it's randomly selected, uh, then they may open your bag and inspect it. Okay, so that's allowed uh, at any time. Uh, they can do it. They may use animals or things like that uh, or chemical swabs or things like that to, to go and uh, also inspect things. Um, okay, uh, now if they open your bag, uh, some people like to lock their bags, essentially, okay? So if you, you want to lock your bag because you don't want someone else accessing it, okay? But if CATSA decide they want to open your bag, right, uh, then that's fine. So they'll, 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 um, they'll just cut the lock off your bag. But now when you land, right, and your bag is sitting there, then there's no lock on it anymore, right? So someone else might walk up and, and they might try and take something out of your bag or, or something like that, okay? Uh, so there was this very clever idea that the U.S. came up with, the USTSA, and they said, okay, we're going to sell these special locks, okay? And so these special locks have two keys that open them. So we'll give the user a key that's so somewhat unique for every lock, and that will open the lock. But we'll also have a TSA key, a special key, and uh, it's like a master key, and it basically will open all of these locks, TSA-approved locks, okay? Um, and so, so that was used for a while. Actually, you can still buy them. So you go, you go to a luggage store and you look at the locks and they have like TSA approved or something on it and they're these special locks, okay? Now, how well does this system work? Uh, I should have left the slide more as a, a mystery, uh, but, but the answer is sort of sitting there. Um, so think about who has this master key, okay? So you have one master key, it opens all of these locks, okay? Uh, for some TSA agent in Montreal to have it, they, they have the master key. And then there's a TSA agent in Toronto, or CATSA in this case, right? They also have to have the key, right? So basically, you have to have a lot of the copies of these keys. Everywhere you have an airport, you have a bunch of agents in the airport, and they all have this key, okay? So this key isn't like the best kept secret in the world, all right? Now let's say that one of those agents, just one, one of 50,000 agents, decides, hey, I'm gonna leak this key, right? I'm gonna sell copies of it, or um, I'm gonna let you 3D print it, right? I'll give you the, the directions for 3D printing it, or whatever the case may be, then what happens? Then the whole system fails, right? All these locks that were sold, they're basically all useless now because the key's out, okay? So that's basically what happened. So there was all this money that went in to you know, design these special locks and there was lock manufacturers and they made it. And then it, it I don't know, it took days or weeks and then all of a sudden you could download a, a 3D uh, printable uh, version of the key and you could print it yourself or just buy one off eBay and it would open any of these locks uh, altogether. Okay, so there's a crypto lesson kind of in here too. I know this is about physical keys, um, but uh, what happened here is actually not that different than, for example, uh, in the days before Netflix, you used to get movies on DVD, which was like a compact disc, and it was encrypted, right? And it was encrypted to, it was meant to stop you from uh, sharing it. Uh, but the problem is, if it's encrypted, you know, your device has to be able to decrypt it, okay? So what that means is every single device, think of all the DVD players in the world, all of them have the same decryption key in it, okay? And all the software that's able to read DVDs, whatever it is. And it just takes one manufacturer of uh, DVD equipment in order to leak that key, right? And now you can copy any DVD you want because it's the same key in all devices, right? If it's different keys in different devices, then 
the company that's making the DVD, they don't know what device you have, right? You can't interact with them. It's not like SSL where you can go back and forth and establish a unique key. There's no back and forth. It's just you go to the, you know, they, they print the DVD, you go to the store and you buy it, right? It's like a one-way communication. Um, and so anyway, so as soon as DVDs like basically came out in software as opposed to hardware, then someone dumped it from RAM and then, then it was everywhere. And um, uh, in future generations of DVD, like Blu-ray, they had this like capability of revoking keys, but once a key's out, you can't really revoke it. But what you could do is you could revoke it on future versions of movies. So like movies would come out, the, the key would leak, and then every movie that came out after, they would revoke that original key on the new movies. So you couldn't watch a movie that was newer. So the technology was actually there, it's called broadcast encryption, but it, as far as I know, they never used it. The key leaked and it just was such a headache to manage all these keys and things, I guess, that they, that they never actually did that revocation process, even though the standard allowed them to do it. Okay, uh, another thing about your bags is that uh, uh, they're physically isolated uh, from you on the plane as well, okay? Uh, and so uh, this, these cabins, I understand that they are pressurized, uh, the cabins, but they, there's no like physical way. There's a door uh, that goes to the outside of the plane, and other than that, it's physically isolated. So there's no way to have something in your bag and then get it out in the flight, okay? Uh, and if you, let's say you manage to get a bomb onto a plane, if you blow up, it's, it's going to blow up in this this container, right? This contained environment. Now, whether that impacts the plane or not, it, it well it depends on how strong the bomb is. But um, but anyways, there is that physical isolation as well. Okay, so that's fine. We we have our bags; uh, they're checked. Okay, so now are we ready to go through security? Is there anything that we have to do before we go through security? We've checked in. We have our boarding pass. We're not on the no-fly. Uh, we have our bags; they're checked. We're ready for security? Yeah? Not quite. So there is actually one step that happens without you even thinking about it, probably. OK, so that's a great thing. I, I should actually include that so I don't have it in the slides. But one thing is you are under constant surveillance, right? Even in the parking lot as you walk into the, into the airport, uh, as you walk around and things like that, uh, there is security surveillance. If you're acting suspicious or something like that, then, then there is a chance that you get uh, caught. Um, so setting that aside, what, what's the one thing that happens before you go to security? So you start at the start of the security line. And before you go in the line, there's someone that's going to scan. Uh, they're just going to scan your, your boarding pass, essentially. Okay. So we call this a pre-screening. And you don't think anything of it, and you probably don't think that there's any security purpose to this, uh, but it turns out that you're wrong, right? Uh, there is a, a security purpose to this. So generally, uh, this will be the same people uh, that are inspecting your bags, uh, that are running the metal detectors and things like that. So they're not with the airline, they work with uh, CA, TSA. Uh, what they do is they scan your boarding pass. Uh, so, so why are they scanning your boarding pass? Okay, okay, so probably the time between you putting your luggage and you going to this person, it's like minutes, so it's conceivable, but, but yeah, that's probably not, it's probably not that they caught something. Okay, so first off, setting security aside, a lot of this is just logistics, right? Are you even in the right line? Like some airports like Montreal, there's two main gates for international and domestic. Uh, flights and U.S. flights. So there's three kinds of flights. There's two gates. Uh, so they'll tell you, oh, you're in the wrong place. Uh, part of it is just time stamping when you go into security before you go in the line. Because the line could be very long. Uh, and then if they see, oh, this person showed up, you know, the 90 minutes before the flight that they were supposed to, yet they're not at the gate, right? So the airline's looking for them. Let's figure out where they are. We know the security line's really long. Then they might come looking for you or they might hold your flight or something like that, okay? Conversely, if they say, oh, this person showed up, you know, 10 minutes ago at the start of the security line, way late for their flight, and we're at the gate and the flight's ready to go and they're nowhere here, they're probably in security, we're going without them or whatever, okay? So it's just, uh, some, some of it's just logistics. Um, 
Oh, another thing too is they, they only scan your boarding pass, okay? So they don't uh, check your identity. This, I've seen it different in the United States. So sometimes the person sitting there will do a password check as well. Uh, but in Canada, they just, they just want to see your boarding pass, that's it. They scan it and then they, they tell you what line to go into. Okay, the second reason is that they actually are tasked sometimes. So we know that this is a program that exists in the US. I don't know that the equivalent li uh, exists in Canada. Um, but they are tasked with trying to determine whether you're acting suspicious or not, in short. Okay, uh, so we call this uh, behavioral screening. So we know about this uh, because of uh, there's there's a report uh, that came out in a, a website called The Intercept, uh, and so they got this secret confidential program uh, from the TSA. Someone leaked it, uh, and so they have this program. Uh, it's called the Spot uh, program, and uh, what it does is it basically has a sort of a checklist of a bunch of stuff that they're looking for, and. Uh, if you meet enough of the criteria, then they'll take action against you. So action against you could be requiring secondary screening, which would be like a pat down in addition to like going through the metal detectors, or it could escalate to notifying law enforcement and then law enforcement would actually uh, take a look at you. Okay, um, so, so they're, they're, they're not just there uh, for logistical reasons, uh, they are there to, to try and gauge security. Now. This document was controversial, which you'll see when you see what the actual criteria are uh, that they're looking for. Um, so what I'm going to do actually is we're, we're actually at a good time for a break. Uh, so why don't we go for 10 minutes? And in the meantime, I'll pull up the original PDF because this is too small to read. And then when you come back, uh, I'll show you what the details are. And then I'll tell you a bit more about how successful or not this program was. So come back in 10 minutes at 10 after. OK, uh, so we'll take a look at the SPOT program. Um, so this isn't necessarily the exact person that's scanning your uh, barcode, but it's something that would happen before you would get into security. Uh, it could be people that are sort of off to the side that you don't see uh, that are doing it, especially if they're filling out an actual piece of paper uh, with a report. And so basically, the idea behind it is they're going to do what's called psychological profiling. So there's a belief that. Uh, people who are deceiving other people will act in a certain way that can be detected. So that's basically what underlies it. And if you show, exhibit enough signs of uh, deception, uh, then we can at least apply more scrutiny to you so that that might result in different things, okay? So it's basically like a, a report card. Uh, so you get a score on uh, different things. It's quite long, so we, we won't go through all of it. Uh, but I'll, I'll just uh, show you some of it. So uh, the first section is called observational and behavioral analysis. Uh, and so what happens is you, you get a point uh, for different things. So for example, if your face is pale because you recently shaved your beard, then you would get one point. Uh, if, you're, I, if you're blinking your eyes really fast, uh, then you uh, might get a point. Uh, if you're at a maple, like in men more particularly, you know, the thing in your throat, if it's kind of jumping around, uh, then you get a point. Uh, if you have strong body odor, uh, you'll get a point. Sweaty palms, trembling. If you're whistling as you walk through, you'll get a point. So these are some notes to take about your future, uh, your future visits to airports. These are, are worse, so they'll give you two points. Um, so if you have some sort of bulge in clothing, uh, if you exaggerate your emotions, like you're excessively laughing or crying, uh, those types of things. Uh, if you're holding your bag too tightly, uh, that type of thing. If you're kind of like looking around, sort of like looking to see where police are, where the security agents are and things like that, uh, that could be it. If your attire is not appropriate, like if you're coming to Montreal in the winter and you're wearing shorts, uh, that type of thing. Uh, widely open staring eyes. Then you get three points for any of these. So these are the really bad things. Uh, so if you appear confused or disoriented, if you appear to be in a disguise, if you start asking about security, uh, if they ask you to do something and you don't do it, uh, if you're sort of secretly signaling to other people that are in line, uh, or if you're kind of like patting yourself 
uh, like kind of feeling yourself, uh, then um, th those will get you three points, okay? Now, if you happen to have a family with you, then that's fine, we'll take two points off whatever points you got. Uh, if you're married and you're over 55, uh, then that's fine. And uh, if you're a female over 55 or a male over 65, uh, then we consider you low risk. And so we'll, we'll take a point off uh, for that, okay? And so basically you can do a couple of these things. If you get at three points, then nothing happens. Uh, but if you get four to five points, then you'll go to uh, secondary screening. Uh, so that means that they'll, uh, like they might pat you down or they might inspect your bags or things like that. And then if you get six or more, then uh, they'll do secondary screening and they'll also tell law enforcement. So LEO means law enforcement officer uh, for it. Okay, um, so th these are, anyway, these are your behavioral analysis. Uh, there's also uh, points based on what the items are that you're carrying. So if you have like a GPS unit, like scuba gear, military gear, uh, a bunch of prepaid cards, rope, duct tape, loose batteries, that kind of stuff, uh, then you'll get a set of points, one point each. And then these are like more specific signs of deception. So some of them overlap with the, the stress factor. Stress and deception, I guess, look the same. Um, but, but anyway, so if, once again, if your Adam Apple is jumping around, uh, if your voice is changing, uh, pitch, uh, then that's a bad sign. Uh, if you cover your mouth and sort of speak through your hand, uh, if you take too long answering questions, uh, then that's bad. Uh, if you give vague responses, if you yawn a lot, you know, you might be tired, but, but if you exaggerate it, uh, then it becomes a sign of deception. Uh, if you're sweating a lot, uh, if you're clearing your throat, if you're blinking fast, again, uh, uh, yeah. And if you're not answering the questions very well, you, you're giving vague answers, you don't have a lot of details, uh, that type of thing. If, if you start walking away um, from the screening area, as soon as you see a, a enforcement officer, that type of thing, um, uh, then yeah, trembling with voice, you're unfamiliar with your passport, those types of things. Well-rehearsed answers that may not respond to questions or may appear to be memorized. Uh, that's another thing. Whistling, again, whistling's really bad. Don't, don't ever whistle. Uh, so then you'll get uh, two to three points. Um, and then uh, these are the things that, that immediately trigger law enforcement. So you do any of these things, it's, it's automatically, doesn't matter how much other stuff uh, you do. Um, so if you, if you have six points from any of the previous sections, uh, there's what they consider suicide bomber indicative behaviors. Uh, if you're disorderly or, dis, or interfering with screening, uh, if you have two, two of the previous signs of deception, uh, any kind of like weapons or things like that, large sums of money, uh, you refuse to submit to screening, uh, purposeful concealment of a prohibited item, uh, you're surveilling, uh, you have unlawful drugs, uh, it's, something's wrong with your travel documents, uh, or if you're traveling with someone and they get referred to law enforcement, then you're going with them as well, okay? Uh, so these ones automatically uh, get set. Um, yeah, and then the, the, the rest of the document is sort of administrative. Yeah, so, so, so I think it's both. So I think uh, they will say it's a random search just to placate you, even if you were selected uh, based on, on, on this or any criteria that they might have. Uh, but I, I think on top of it, they actually, do, they actually do things randomly as well. So I think they have a computer system that probably tells them uh, when, when things are, are random. But uh, yeah, if you're, if you're getting selected for random searches a lot, then it starts to look like it's not random, right? It's probably based on something else. Okay, so that's the uh, SPOT program. Uh, this was a, a testimony that was given to, uh, to, to one of the congressional groups, I, I forget which one. Uh, so this is a psychologist and uh, she's an expert in the area. So this is from an article out of the ACLU. She says, uh, humans barely do barely better than 50% in trying to guess whether someone's being deceptive or not. 
So you might have a very, very slight advantage, but basically it's, it's impossible to tell. Um, there's uh, no great variations in individual's ability to s detect deception, meaning if you spend a long time training, if you've been doing this job as a CT, CA, TSA agent for five years, you aren't necessarily better at reading people than someone who's just doing it for the very first time. Um, Supposed experts such as cops and custom agents are no better than anyone else. There's few, if any, reliable cues to deception, and people frequently misread the signs of stress, nervousness, and discomfort as indicating lies. So there's a lot of reasons why you might be stressed in an airport that have nothing to do with you being a terrorist, for example. Uh, and so you could get a lot of false positives, right? So anyway, so this is one critique of it. Another thing you could do is you could look at the data um, so, uh, SPOT, I guess, is continuing. It has a new name now called Behavioral Detection and Analysis, or BDA. And remember, it's initially about countering terrorism. So this is about CT, or, well, TSA in the U.S. Um, their main mandate is, is about safety of the airline industry itself. Uh, it was a very expensive program doing all the training. Uh, it was estimated to cost, it, it just at first, $900 million, but then there's recurring costs as well. Um, and so anyway, one set of data, they looked at five weeks in an airport, and uh, they looked at the, the, the program. Uh, and so 429 or 4% of people were sent to secondary screening. So they met the criteria of enough points, not to get necessarily referred to law enforcement, but just to secondary screening. And then of those 429, only 47 were got enough points that they also went to law enforcement after it okay and if you look at the 47 that referred to law enforcement 16 were arrested uh 14 were arrested for immigration reasons so they had the wrong documents uh one was arrested because they were intoxicated one person was arrested because they had uh unlawful drugs and exactly zero were terrorists which is why we were spending the $900 million uh, in the first place was to detect terrorism. Um, and so uh, the, the main uh, critique of this from a political perspective is that it's really about trying to catch undocumented workers uh, or people without documentation, illegal immigration and things like that. Uh, that that's the main purpose of it. People are pretending it's about security, uh, but it actually has nothing to do with security. Okay, so we made it past the spot program and the, we got our boarding pass screened or scanned and all of that stuff. So what's next? Are we finally at security with the metal detectors or is there anything else uh, before that? So the answer is we're finally there. Um, so we go to the screening. Okay, so screening is also conducted by CATSA in Canada. Um, they will scan your boarding pass again. Uh, once again, this is mostly probably logistical just to say, okay, you made it to the front of the line now. We scanned it at the back of the line, now you're at the front of the line. Uh, so, so we'll just keep track of that so we know where you are in the airport process. Um, and uh, what it's going to be is a search of you and the items that you're carrying onto the flight. So the items that you checked are being searched behind the scenes and this will search the items that, that you bring. Okay, so how, uh, what are the technologies that are used uh, to, 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 uh, to examine you? Not your items, just you as a person. Okay, Okay. so we have a metal detector, so you walk through. Uh, if you have any metal, you're supposed to put it in the bin first, and then there's a separate x-ray for your items. So it's now lo no longer an item with you, it's just you. Uh, and if you, if you have uh, any kind of metal, then that's, that's it, okay? Is there anything else besides this? So like the wand, okay, so same idea, it's a metal detector, but it's just a handheld form as well. It's also looking for metal. Is there any reason someone would have metal in their body? Yeah, lots of reasons, right? There's, uh, um, well, yeah, so there are clothing items that you forgot to, to lose, but there's all sorts of surgeries and things like that, reconstruction, and uh, you, you might have metal uh, inside you uh, for, for surgical reasons. Okay, so there's a metal detector. Anything else? Anyone done anything other than a metal detector? Okay, 
OK, OK. OK, so that's technically an item. So I'm trying to separate you from your item. So this is just about you. That will be your item. But the chemical thing is something they'll do to you as well. So they may ask you to go step over to the side once you go through. Uh, they'll have like big long tweezers. They'll have like a piece of cotton on the end and they'll like kind of wipe it on your hands and maybe on your clothes. Then they put it in a machine and the machine is detecting uh, different substances uh, that might be on you. Mostly, my understanding, related to bomb making material as opposed to drugs. So you might think it could go either way, but it's, it's mostly about uh, bombs. Okay, so there's the chemical swabs. There's the metal detector. Anything else? Okay, so any like deception signs, fear signs, like, stress signs, those could also be in play as well. Yeah. Anything else? Okay, so a physical pat down, right? So sometimes as a secondary screening, uh, what they'll do is they'll, they'll search you, they'll feel you, uh, and they'll, they'll look for any items that you might be concealing on your body. Uh, so this could be over the clothes uh, with the back of the hand with a, a agent of whatever gender you identify with, they'll try and find someone that's the same gender. Uh, and uh, yeah, so there's the physical pat down and there's some rules and regulations around it. Uh, okay, so that's good, so we have four. So we have metal detector, physical pat down, chemical swabs, maybe we just have three. The wand, anything else? Okay, so that's one thing they might be searching for, but I don't know that they have a special device for that. Okay, are all metal detectors the same? Uh, so what, what's the difference? Exactly, okay. So some of them you walk in and you kind of put your hands up and it's like more of like a booth that surrounds you completely. So that's actually a, a different technology. So that's a scan of your body. So it's, it's, it's an x-ray machine essentially. Uh, and so they're x-raying uh, your body. The x-rays can see through your clothes. Uh, someone gets a nude picture of you without your clothes and with whatever items that you have that show up uh, at that, that are exposed with that technology. Uh, again, there's policies that govern even that. So for example, the person that's looking at the screen is not supposed to be in the same room as you yourself. So they're just looking at the screen. They're off in some other room. They're close by, so if there's a problem, they can alert. Uh, but they're not, be, they're not supposed to be able to like sort of check you out in line and then wait and see your, your nude uh, photograph show up on the screen, okay? Um, so there's policies and procedures around that. Okay, anything else? So sometimes animals are used as well. So not, it wouldn't be the sole thing. Uh, sometimes it's when you're in line. Uh, so there, uh, there have been times where uh, I've been at the airport, we're all like standing around and they bring a dog and they ask everyone to put their bag in front of them and then the dog goes around and uh, smells them, uh, that type of thing. Okay, so, the, so we have this, the scanner, the x-ray scanner. By the way, you're, you're, allowed to, uh, you're allowed to not go through the x-ray scanner if you don't want to, okay? Either for privacy reasons or for health reasons, right? Uh, a lot of, if you frequently fly, like say you're a pilot and you're uh, a flight attendant or something like that, you still have to go through screening. So those people are screened as well. They have a separate screening area that's just for uh, airline personnel. Uh, but they won't go through these x-ray machines because uh, there's a chance that it causes cancer. And if you're going through it, you know, 10 times a week as opposed to once every month or something, that, that arguably makes a difference, okay? But if you don't even like the risk of going through it once, you are allowed to opt out in most countries, including Canada and the U.S. And in that case, you'll get a pat down. So you'll get a physical uh, inspection if you don't want to do it. Okay. Uh, the, the, uh, so they, they can open your bag and, and look at it. So that, that's actually more about your items. Uh, so they can use animals uh, to do it. Uh, and then they have the chemical swaps, okay? Uh, so those are the main, uh, the main things that they're looking at. Okay, so now let's go to the items themselves. So what, what happens to the items? So you have a carry-on bag, what do you do with it? Okay, so you put it on a conveyor belt, it goes through, it goes through an x-ray scan, so it's the same as the thing that's scanning you as a person uh, with your hands up, 
Okay, it's not a metal detector, it's an actual X-ray uh, scanner so it can see uh, inside your bag. Um, and uh, once it comes out the other end, then there may be any one of these methods may also additionally be used, okay? So they might open it up, inspect it manually, they might use a dog, they might use a chemical swabber on, on the bag as well. All right, what are some of the things that you can't take through security? Can you take anything you want through? Okay, so what can't you take through? All right. Water and weapons, right? Okay, okay, so here's the list, the official list from Transport Canada. Uh, so they say uh, basically weapons, uh, things that could stun or immobilize someone, uh, sharp objects that could cause serious injury, uh, tools that could cause injury either to a person or to the aircraft itself. Um, so this includes like pocket knives and like those kinds of things uh, which you might have on you. I once had a pocket knife taken away. Uh, blunt objects that could cause serious injury, so this would be more like a bat or something like that, uh, or a baton. Uh, anything explosive, obviously. Uh, so the liquid uh, criteria is you're allowed to carry um, containers that are under 100 milliliters. Okay, so that's the first restriction. But can you take as many 100 millimeters under 100 millimeter things as you want? No. So they'll give you a Ziploc bag. You're supposed to actually have your stuff in this Ziploc bag, this official one, but no one does it. But anyways, officially it should fit in a one liter uh, bag. All, all your liquid items and each individual item has to be under 100 ml, okay? Um, or 100 grams if it's measured by weight as opposed to, like if it's a paste or something, it might be by weight instead of by volume. Um, any kind of like, like if you have acids, uh, or, or toxic materials, like those types of things, uh, those are also prohibited. And then if you have like organic matter, uh, that, that could also be uh, prohibited. Um, or it might be based on size. Uh, so you might be able to take some on, but, but not. Um, it de yeah, so it depends on what exactly it is. Okay, uh, I'm always getting ahead of myself. Okay, is there any exemption to the liquid rule? So is it true that the, there's no possible way you could ever carry something more than 100 ml onto it? Say it loud. Sorry? Uh, okay. Sorry, I'm hearing lots of people talk, but I can't understand for some reason. Okay, so alcohol, duty-free. Okay, so duty-free is its own thing. Sorry, is that what you were saying? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so duty-free is it's, it's a special thing. So you might, uh, usually the duty-free is after security. So when you're in the secure zone. Uh, and then they, you can get it where it's sealed, like in a bag and it has a special seal on it. But that's no guarantee. So let's say that you have a connecting flight. So you buy it in the secure zone of Montreal, then you fly to Paris and now you're connecting from Paris to somewhere else. If you don't land in the secure zone in Paris, you'll have to go through security again. Now there's, sure, it's a sealed bag, but it's a sealed with Canada. What do Paris people know about Canada, right? Like they don't, they can't know about all the seals in all the countries, right? And so you won't necessarily be able to, to carry that on further. So you can always buy it at your final destination. Uh, but yeah, so that, there could be an exemption there, but, but you can't guarantee it. Anything else? Okay, so one thing I've done is I've traveled with kids, okay, babies. And uh, if you have breast milk or formula, then you are allowed to bring basically a, as much as you want. Um, so you can have a big box full of, uh, of um, uh, so, it, so the actual specification says any liquid aerosol or gel other than formula, milk, breast milk, juice, or food for infants that's in a container larger than 100 ml or 100 grams and cannot fit in a one liter sealed plastic bag. Okay, so that's one exemption. So let's say, first off, why, why, are the, why is there even a, a restriction on liquids in the first place? What, what are they trying to do with that? Why do they care whether you bring a bottle of water onto a plane? Okay, okay, so they're worried about liquid explosives. Okay, so it's, it's once again, it comes back down to terrorism and bombs, and they're worried that, that your water bottle isn't actually water, 
Okay, it's something that's either going to do harm to another person on the plane or it's going to do harm to the plane itself. Okay, so that's why you can't do it. Now, why can't you hide your bomb as, you know, breast milk? Make it look milky and then bring it on the plane. Nothing, there's no reason for it, right? Uh, so it's, you, you could do that, right? Uh, and it's just that they don't want to restrict it. If they try and restrict it and you have an infant and you're not allowed to bring on things that can feed it, right? They, they can't have that either, right? So they're sort of stuck in a hard place and so you have an exemption. Do terrorists know about this? Is this like a well kept secret and, and no terrorist knows? Until you have kids, you don't know about this rule? No, of course not. The terrorists know all these rules inside and out right, as well as the enforcement agents know them themselves, okay? So it's kind of uh, ridiculous. Is there anything else like this? So it says, it says here, like, it gives the exemptions. Uh, is, is there anything else that, that would be like it? Medicines, okay, so, uh, yeah, so if you have a prescription for a medicine, I, I can't imagine it being more than 100 ml. Like, usually medicines are in pill format or something like that. I guess it's possible that they're liquid, but um, that, that would seem like a lot of medicine, but that, that could potentially be a, an exception. Or they could be packaged in individual 100 ml bottles instead of, uh, of one. Anything else? So there's one weird exemption uh, that's actually very related to medicine, but it's not a med you wouldn't really think of it as a medicine, and it's not something that you need a prescription for. Uh, and so if anyone wears glasses, you may uh, also have contact lenses, right? And so for whatever reason, if you have any kind of uh, contact lens fluid, uh, then that somehow is exempt. So you can bring big bottles of it. I suppose it's because it's not so useful if you don't have a lot of it, um, but I, I'm not actually sure what the rationale is behind it. So there's uh, one person in particular in the security community named Bruce Schneier, and he wrote a bunch of books on security, like popular novel, not novels, but books, popular nonfiction books uh, about security. And it also does some academic work as well. And so um, he's always criticizing uh, airport security and trying to uh, uh, bend the rules or whatever. And so there's a nice article that's on the Moodle uh, that was published in the Atlantic. And it goes through how they like, uh, basically he goes with the, the person who's writing the article and they try and bring on the craziest items that they can. Uh, so they bring on like ropes and things like that. They have flags for uh, terrorist organizations or governments that are tied to terrorism and things like that. And people don't even know what they are. Like the agents don't even know what they are. And uh, they they printed out fraudulent uh, boarding passes so that they can get priority boarding even though they don't have it and things like that. And so one thing he did is he also brought on contact lens fluid. So if you read the article, it says uh, he carried two bottles labeled saline solution. So it wasn't even an official bottle. It was just some random bottle that had like masking tape and he wrote like saline solution on it. Uh, 24 ounces in total. So I forget what that is in milliliters, but it's way above the, the 100 ml limit uh, through security. And then the funny thing is an officer asked him, why do you need two bottles? And he said, because I have two eyes. <laughs> and he was allowed to keep the bottles. They were like, yeah, that's fine. You're allowed to have saline solution. And, and so he skated through. Sure, sure, sure. So th th there would be like, the, first off, the airline's allowed to take stuff on the plane, right? Like the airline has water bottles and things like that. So um, usually the airline would have like a med kit or something like that with like a bunch of things. And then if someone, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know the rules. I assume that like if you're hooked up to like a drip thing and uh, you're trying to, and you're able to fly, you're like clear to fly, but you need to bring it with you, then, then you're allowed to, to go on with that type of stuff. So anything that's like you have a prescription for is fine. Yeah. Um, okay, another thing is, uh, uh, okay, you have your bag, you have a laptop in your bag, what do you have to do? Okay, you have to take it out, why? Okay, okay, so, so you wanna separate from the other equipment, other stuff in the bag, and it could be a bomb, 
Okay, so that's basically it. It, uh, it looks, under an x-ray, it looks kind of like a bomb. There's a bunch of circuitry. And if you have some other stuff that's around it, uh, I could also like mask other things that are in your bag, but the main concern is just that it, it could be a bomb. Um, sorry, i getting, getting ahead of myself. Uh, and so what do you do? So you take it out of the bag, you put it in separately. Does that prove it's not a bomb? No, right? Uh, so why do you why do you have to separate it? it gets so it gets scanned separately. That's fine. I mean, it, it was either a bomb in your bag or not. The X-ray can see through your bomb, or th sorry, could see through your bag. So the main reason they make you pull it out is if they're suspicious of it, their test of whether it's a bomb or not is they'll make you turn it on, and if it powers up, then it's obviously not a bomb, right? Now think about like what's the smallest Arduino chip that would actually like power a computer on? Like just show a login screen. Does it have to take up like all the volume that's inside of a laptop? No, like you could have like some small chip that's hooked up to the screen that would simulate the idea of an operational computer and you have lots of space left over, you know, for, for, for your actual bomb. Um, so, so anyways, but uh, this, this was a concern that, that people were doing it. Uh, and the other thing is uh, if you have a tablet like an iPad, Right? Do you have to take it out? You don't, actually. So the rules say only laptops. So if you, so my MacBook Air, which is probably about the same size as an iPad, it has to come out, but the iPads can go through. Uh, what else do we do? We take off our shoes, right? Why do we take off our shoes? It might be a bomb, right? Same as everything. In this case, it actually was a bomb at one point. So. There was a time when we never had to take our shoes off and someone did put a bomb in their shoe. They went on a flight. They were trying to light it uh, on the flight and people thought it was suspicious that the person was trying to light their shoe on fire and so they tackled them and took their shoes away. And then when they uh, investigated it, it turned out there was a bomb in the plane. Or sorry, in the shoe. Uh, so now we all take our shoes off, at least in the US. Uh, I don't think in Canada we have to anymore, but there was a time period uh, where we did have to take them off. And so the criticism uh, from Bruce Steyer and other people like it is sort of twofold. One is he calls this all security theater. It's meant to make you feel better. You read about bombs in shoes on the news. Now you're taking your shoes off. And so the airport's doing something about it so you don't have to worry about it, okay? But in reality, if you're a terrorist and you know they're checking shoes more closely than something else, are you going to put a bomb in a shoe? No, okay? So you're always sort of protecting against what the terrorists did last week, okay? Last week they had a bomb in a laptop, so now we check the laptop. They had a bomb in the shoe, so we check the shoe. They had a liquid bomb, so now we make you throw out your water bottles, okay? And so his argument is that none of this is actually providing real security. Uh, it's, it's just really theater uh, in order to make you feel better uh, about flying and make you feel safe and, and that the government's taking this seriously. Uh, and what they're doing is they're setting aside real things that they could be doing instead uh, that would, would actually have better impacts on, on catching terrorists. Uh, that's a good question. I, I should have a slide with his like proposed revisions uh, online. I'm, I'm sure, I'm absolutely sure that he does, but I forgot to include it. I can't think off the top of my head what they are. Check out the Atlantic article. I'm sure at, somewhere at the end he'll say about what he thinks is better. And yeah, that's a good thing to add for next time. All right, finally, we're through security. What is there that's left? So there's the gate. We pick up our luggage. Uh, let's say that we're flying from, I don't know, France into Canada because we're coming back from Europe. Is there an extra step before when we get off the plane? So we land in Montreal. Do we just walk out of the airport? Okay, so immigration or customs, we have to go through. We're going across a border. So this, this uh, may or may not happen. Um, so in this sequence of events, I'm going to assume that just like if you were flying to the US from Montreal, we'll do this before you actually get on the plane. So uh, for, for the US only in Montreal, you actually go through US customs here in Montreal. And then when you get off the plane, you don't have to do customs. But for most other countries, like 
flying between two countries, you'll do the customs at the very end. Okay, it doesn't matter when you do it, um, but let's let's deal with it now uh, before we get on the plane. Okay, uh, what what what's what's the concern of customs? I mean, you you've already gone through security. You're not carrying anything that hasn't been seen through X-rays and chemical swabs and all that stuff. What what what's what's the additional step here? What does this have to do with? Okay, say it louder. Okay, and why do they care about that? Okay, okay. And who are these people? Are they the same people that are running the metal detectors? Is it the police? Okay, so it's its own organization. Okay, so you have CATSA in Canada. You have Canada Border Services. These are Canada Boarding Services. Then you have police on top of it, whether it's Quebec Police, Montreal Police, or Federal Police like the RCMP. Um, and so, yeah, so there's lots of people walking around with uniforms and guns and things like that, but they're not all the same, okay? So these guys, they really just care about why are you coming into the country? Are you authorized to come in? They also care about what you're bringing Okay, so they do care about what's in your bags, okay, but they don't care about it necessarily from a terrorist perspective, okay? That obviously is a concern of everyone that you talk to, but their, their primary goal isn't about the safety of the airport, and there's a bunch of stuff they care about that they don't care about at, like, the security gates uh, themselves. Um, so, yeah, so for international travel, you'll go through customs. Uh, it could be before you board the plane or after you land. In this case, they will check all your identity. So they're going to want to see your passport. They're going to look at your face. They're going to look at the photo. They're going to make sure that you are who your passport says you are. Uh, they probably want to see your boarding pass. It might just be automated, uh, but, but they'll look at the details. They'll figure out where you're flying from. Uh, their questions might uh, have to do with that. And then they want to know what status you have. So do you have a work permit? Do you have a visitor's permit? Uh, do you need a visa? You know, whatever, whatever it is. Okay, so they consider terrorism, it's one thing, but uh, there's other things they care about. So some things would be like large amounts of cash. So you're not allowed to bring in Canada $10,000 equivalent of whatever currency. Uh, the equivalent in Canadian dollars can't be in excess of $10,000 without declaring it. Okay, so that, that's one caveat. It's not that you cannot bring it across, it's just that you have to declare it. So if you uh, they'll ask you, usually they'll make you fill out a form and they'll say, do you have anything to declare, right? And so there's a bunch of stuff, you can bring it across, it's just you have to declare it. But if you don't declare it, uh, then, then, uh, then it's, you're subject to a fine or a penalty or arrest, I guess, if, it, if, if it's serious enough. Um, controlled substances, so that can vary from country to country, right? So for example, uh, you're allowed to carry a certain amount of marijuana with you in Canada. Right, but if you go to the U.S., go through U.S. Customs, no, you can't have that. Right, uh, so that's an example. So countries could be different. Weapons to the the laws change. Right, you can't have a handgun. Well, there's exemptions and things like that. But generally, like in the U.S., there's a lot of places where you can carry a handgun. You can't do that in Canada. Generally, you wouldn't be allowed to take that on the plane, anyways. Um, another thing is food. Uh, so uh, you don't think about it, but if you're coming from another country and you got some food. And there's a chance that there's some sort of uh, like insect or something on it. And if that comes into the country and then it could cause an infestation uh, of like some species that's not here already, uh, then that's actually very tightly controlled as well. Um, so uh, there's, there's, there's a fun show. Uh, it got canceled because there, there was a big privacy concern over it, but it ran for about three seasons called uh, border services. I can't actually. I can't remember. Secure border, I, I, border security. Maybe I don't know. Anyways, it was like a reality TV show, and it was under like it was just like people going through security and uh, the different things that they flagged. And so it, it included airports. It was also like land things, like land border crossings and things like that. And some of the people consented to having their face shown. Other times it was like it was like. Um, uh, fuzzed out, but it was like real footage of real people. And so a lot of it's just like food, like people bringing food over and not declaring it and things like that. Um, and so some of these items you're not allowed to bring. And then, like I said, some of it, you just have to declare it. 
you might have to pay something. So if you're if you're bringing a lot of goods, like say you go somewhere, you go on a shopping spree, you are allowed to bring. I think it's two hundred dollars if it's less than twenty four hours or something like that. So you can spend more, but then you have to pay a tax on top of it. You have to declare it. Okay. Um, yeah. And then uh, if there's a problem with border services, okay, they're suspicious of you. They have an extreme amount of power. Okay. So they can basically detain you. They can pull you off. They'll make you miss your flight. They'll put you in a jail. Uh, you, um, you do have the right to remain silent, so you always have that right. Uh, and you can ask to speak to a lawyer, uh, but it, it's sort of complicated. I've, I've heard conflicting things about it. I don't, I'm not a legal expert, so I'm not sure exactly what your rights are. Um, but uh, basically, they can also inspect all of your items, okay? So what they do on the show a lot, which I didn't realize, but you see it, is someone will come and they'll say, oh, I'm coming into Canada and I'm here for a visit. I'm here for a holiday, two weeks, and then I'm going back. And they'll be like, well, you don't have a return flight booked, right? So why, why should I believe that you're only coming here for a two-week holiday? And they'll be like, oh, I am, I am, you know. They'll be like, okay, who are you staying with? Where are you going? You're going to a hotel? And they'll be like, oh, I'm staying with a friend. They're like, okay, give me your phone, unlock it, give me your pin. What's your friend's name? And then they'll call them and they'll be like, hi, I'm standing here at the border with this person. Are you expecting them? And then why are they there? And they're like, oh yeah, they're coming to like do some work on my, like work for me or whatever. And then they're like, okay, like, no, that's you. You need a work permit, for example, in order to do that, okay? So they'll go through your phone, they'll go through your emails, they'll call people that are in your phone, they'll ask you who can verify your story, they'll call them, right? So it's, it's like a very uh, intense search. It's not just like, what's the stuff that you're carrying, right? They'll go to, they'll investigate it to whatever depth they, they want to, right? And then at the end of the day, they might send you back. So they might, they might deny you access to a country, which means that you also can't come back for a certain number of years. They might just say, we're going to pretend like you never tried to come into Canada, so you just go back and then there's no record of it. Um, or if it's serious enough, they could involve law enforcement or things like that. Yeah. So I haven't heard of that where they take, yeah, where they hang on to your items. Usually you leave with your items as well, but that's possible. It doesn't surprise me that they would have the right to do that, but I haven't heard of that specifically. Yeah, but you are compelled to uh, unlock your devices. So this was also something that was subject to like court cases. Like what, what if you like are just like, I forgot my password or whatever. And so you are compelled to, uh, to do it. You're not allowed to just say, I'm not unlocking the device. Okay, so the very last step is we're now ready to get on the flight itself. And there's one last check uh, that's finally done. So you wait in line, you jump the front of the line because you printed your boarding pass with the boarding group one. And so now you're about to go. And what are they doing? They're standing, first off, who's sitting at this gate? Is this TSA, is it law enforcement? Okay, so it's just the airline itself. So Air Canada. Uh, and what do they ask for? Boarding pass, so they scan your boarding pass, they check your seat, and do they ask for your identity? Okay, does it have to be a passport? Okay, so some people are saying any government ID, some people are saying passports only. So there's actually a difference here on whether you're flying internationally or domestically. So if you're flying internationally, it has to be a passport. And if you're flying domestically, like I'm flying to Toronto from Montreal, I can just show a driver's license or some sort of photo ID. Uh, and, and, and that's fine. Okay, so you uh, basically you show your boarding pass, you show our, your ID, they'll do a face check, they'll make sure that you're the person that matches the ID that you're showing. Uh, the boarding pass will hook into a back-end server uh, and then they'll just make sure that there's no like update on your no-fly status. They'll make sure that you're actually assigned a seat. Uh, sometimes you're flying standby or something like that so you have no seat assigned and so they won't let you on the flight uh, if they don't. Uh, if you don't have a seat yet, and then uh, basically they, they either let you on the plane or they don't let you on the plane. Okay, now depending on how you navigate an airport, there is a good chance that this is actually the only time in the whole process that uh, your ID 
like a face check with your ID and a check of your boarding pass is done at the same time. Okay, so let's rewind and think about it. Let's say that I am not checking any luggage, I'm just carrying on, I do the mobile check-in. So when I go into the airport, I go right past the gate and all that, or sorry, the, the desk and stuff like that. I don't talk to any human. First human I talk to is the person at the start of the security line, okay? So they scan my boarding pass, that's fine. Then I go to security, they scan my boarding pass again. No one looked at my passport, okay? Then let's assume either I'm flying domestically, so I don't go through security, or sorry, through border services, or I'm flying to a country where they're not doing border services in Montreal. So they'll do it after the flight, okay? Um, then I go all the way to the gate, and it's like two minutes before I'm about to get on the plane that someone finally says, okay, I wanna see your boarding pass, I wanna see the name on your boarding pass, I wanna see your picture, I wanna see your face, and I'm gonna triangulate those three pieces of information and make sure that all of it's consistent uh, with each other. Now, it used to be worse in the US if you flew domestically, they wouldn't actually check your ID. So what they would do is they would just look at your boarding pass and that was it. So your boarding pass was like, you know, a bearer instrument, so if it had the data on it, that's that, if it had your name on it, that's who you were, okay? Now they changed that um, because it ended up actually being a big problem because if they don't check it at the gate, then nobody's checking all that information. Some people are, might look at your passport only, some people might look at your boarding pass only, but nobody's checking all that information together, right? So think of it as you have an ID check, there's also the no-fly list, and then you have your boarding pass. So those are three things that need to be consistent with each other, okay? And if they don't do the ID check at the gate, then um, actually, okay, so when, when you check in, let's say you, uh, you, know, you go up to the kiosk, they'll just check whether you're on the no-fly list, okay? But they're not checking you, they're checking whether the name that your ticket is booked in is on the no-fly list, okay? That's not a check of you, it's just a check of whether your boarding pass matches the no-fly list. And then uh, they may do some sort of ID check where they check your boarding pass, okay? But the airline is the one that got the answer about your no-fly list. So anybody in between that's like a security agent that does actually ask for your passport and do the check, they don't know whether you're on the no-fly list or not. Um, and then it's finally when you, board the pa when you board the flight that they check all three of this information together, okay? So this policy does work, this procedure works when, because eventually someone does check all these three pieces of information. But if you live in a country where they don't do the ID check at the gate, right, uh, then what happens? Now nobody's checking all three of these pieces of information, but there are some people that are checking two of it and other people are checking a different two. So is that enough? Okay, no. So our intuition says no, hopefully as security people. So what you can do is you could actually print two boarding passes, okay? You could have one boarding pass that's in somebody else's name and that's what you book the flight in. So you just pick a random person that you don't think is on the terrorist watch list. You book a flight in their name. Okay, now that's going to be a problem because you don't have a passport for that name, right? And I'm going to assume that you can't fake a passport because that's actually substantially more hard, okay? But we know that the boarding passes have no security on them. So you can completely fake a boarding pass, okay? So could you get all the way onto the airplane doing this? And the answer is, without that ID check, the answer is yes. So you would show the real boarding pass uh, basically when you check in, you would check in under the real boarding pass. And then when you board the flight, you would also show the real boarding pass with the real name of the person that's not on the no-fly list. And then if anyone else stops you along the way and they say, I wanna see your passport and your boarding pass, then you pull out your real passport port that has your name on it, your actual name and your actual face, and you have a fake boarding pass, okay? Nobody's flying under that name. Okay, but the person that's checking is not airline security. They're, or sorry, they're not, uh, they're not the airline, they're security. And they don't have access to Air Canada's database, right? Uh, they just have access to what, whatever. They can scan a QR code and it can tell them what's encoded on the QR code, okay? Um, and so then you just show them a name that doesn't even have a flight booked, right? That does match the passport, so they do the ID check and then you get through that step. Okay, so there was someone, a researcher, uh, a long time ago who, who pointed this out named Chris Segoyan. Um, 
he uh, got his uh, door kicked down by the FBI and they seized all his computers as a result of doing this. He also had a website that showed you how easy it was to fake a boarding pass. I think you could just type in the information you want and press a button and then it would spit out a fake boarding pass. So they didn't like it. Um, and then uh, eventually, begrudgingly, they realized that uh, this, there's actually a flaw here and we need to fix it. And so then they started requiring ID checks at the gate uh, by the airline for domestic and international flights both. And so it was uh, eventually fixed. And this was way back in 2008. So it's been fixed, or that might actually even say 2000. So anyways, it's now completely fixed. OK, so that was the whole airline thing. So thank you for going through the, air, the airport with me. Uh, so what are some lessons that we can learn from all of this policy and procedure stuff? And so um, there's a couple challenges, I guess, that make this hard. Like, why is it that no one noticed that, that flaw where you could have two fake boarding passes, right? So part of the, the uh, sort of complexity was that you actually have different organizations that are governing different things, right? So the airline, they know the people who actually should be on the flight, right? A security agent knows what a fake passport looks like and a real passport, but they don't necessarily know who's supposed to be on the flight, right? Boarding passes, no one can tell whether they're real or fake because there's, there's nothing about it. Maybe the airline can because it will be inconsistent with their database. But just looking at the boarding pass itself as a document, you can't tell whether it's real or fake. Okay? And then some people are, you know, they're trying to catch terrorists. Other people are trying to catch undocumented workers. Sometimes they get confused about who they're trying to catch. And so you have all these different organizations that have different pieces of data and they all have different goals. Right? And somehow they're all supposed to come together in this sort of elaborate song and dance and enforce some security properties that uh, transcend any individual's mandate. Okay? So that's hard to do. Okay? It's also hard to change. Because right? if you see a flaw in it, you have to go to the right people and get the right people to change. Okay? So that's one thing that makes it really complicated is that you have lots of different people that are involved. Uh, another thing they point out in the paper uh, quote is technological sophistication and research novelty are negatively correlated with security impacts on users. Okay, so basically meaning that when academics write papers, we like to write about static analysis because it's really technical. We have lots of Greek symbols and we can uh, generate all sorts of charts, you know, with, you know, numbers of errors and calculate false positive rates and all of that type of stuff, do some statistical analysis. And it's all really, really hard work. Okay, so when you go read security papers and you look at conferences, it's full of those kinds of papers uh, because it's, you know, it looks fancy and it looks hard to do. Okay, but on the other hand, something like policies, like what's your policy around someone calls up and says they want to switch their phone number attached or the SIM card that's attached to the phone number, right? That's, it's harder, like you don't write a paper about it, right? Uh, and so there's, there's no Greek symbols or, or computer code or math or anything involved in that type of research. So researchers tend not to do that, even though this stuff is as important and maybe more important if you especially think about all the crimes that are committed and what avenues people use, right? People use social engineering, they use, uh, they use flaws and policies and procedures as much as now probably more than they use like actual technical attacks. Um, there's also, uh, sorry, um, okay, okay, I'll just skip that. Uh, okay, so, so what are some solutions uh, to the problem? So one thing they propose is maybe you could do, have normal users audit things, right? So for example, in their paper, they wanted to understand SIM swapping, so they just called up a bunch of different phone lines uh, and, they, and they just tried to see what, what was the policies and how many times could they get through it or, or whatever, okay? Um, now the problem with this is it's a lot of manual labor. It's just like a user study, like someone has to call and things like that. And so it's really hard to do these audits unless if you're going to devote you know, hundreds of hours uh, doing it. Um, also their university said, uh, I forget what their university said, but, but anyways, basically as soon as you talk to a customer service agent, they're technically a human subject, right? And so it's like you're doing a user study 
with this person that's answering the phone they're not consenting to it because they don't know that they're part of a. It's not like they showed up and said, I volunteer for your user study. You're calling someone and they're unwittingly being part of your user study. And so it gets complicated in terms of whether you can get clearance. They got clearance for whatever they did, but it's not necessarily the case that you'll be able to get clearance. Um, they also suggest that, that maybe we should have a well-paved uh, process. Like if I find a security flaw uh, in Microsoft Windows, I can go to Microsoft and I can fill out a bug bounty form. They'll prioritize it, they'll look at it. I may even make money, you know, disclosing if it turns out to be a critical flaw, okay? But there isn't that kind of procedure for, uh, for, for procedural flaws or policy flaws, okay? So if you find some flaw like that, you don't know who to report, who do you contact? They try to contact companies. I know other people that have found like these kinds of flaws and, and you just don't know who to contact. Right, and uh, half the time you don't get put through to the right person and things like that, and so institutions won't change as a result. Um, you can also look at regulation. So on SIM swapping, for example, the uh, FCC in the US is looking at um, doing some regulation that might try and make these attacks harder or try and say that this is like how uh, mm -hmm. telecom must do things, right? or remember the United States Postal Service, right? So they could change, the government could step in and say, hey, you wanna change address, this is the policy that you must follow type of thing. So you can push for regulation as well. Uh, and then there's whistleblowing or just leaking it to the press, right? Making a big deal of it, going on Twitter, saying how bad it is, writing a cover page article on Wired Magazine that got Amazon to change their policy really quick. Um, so th those types of things, okay? But none of these are like hard science. Right? So the, and none of them are like, like what we would look for for an evaluation methodology. Uh, some other things that, that, that uh, not from the paper, but, but just sort of my own thoughts. Uh, some people thought about uh, using formal methods. So if you can turn a policy into logic, right, then you have a logical description of what's happening. Are, are you allowed to authorize, are you authorized in order to do this? Like do you have access to uh, change, reset a password on an account, right? And then you think of all the paths that you might do it, right? Then eventually you'll find the path of adding the credit card and then now knowing the last four digits of the credit card you added and then resetting it, okay? So there's a chance that you could uncover that. You could even cover, uncover it with a computer program that just searches for every path through a policy, but you would have to first encode the policy, okay, in, in logic, okay? And so this seems maybe like it's promising, but it also is, is sort of problematic. So um, uh, there's a chance you miss something when you model it, and then you just will miss the attack completely if you don't model it completely. Uh, you also, when you, when you model it for, like say I mo model it for Amazon for password resets, that's fine. But if Apple wants to use it, I have to remodel it because they have different policies and procedures, right? So everything is highly custom. Uh, it's not like a general procedure where you can prove it once. Uh, now, maybe you could prove a general, like a, a suggested procedure and then have other companies adopt that procedure because it's tested. Okay, so that, that might be a path forward. But anyways, for now, it would be a, a matter of customization and you can't easily reuse it. Um, and uh, another thing I didn't include too is that there's a lot of variants as well. So you might have a policy, it might be written down. It's one thing to write it down. It's another thing to have every single one of your, say, customer service agents enforce the policy to the letter, right? They may be able to make exemptions and things like that or willing to make exemptions. Or there was one in the social engineering where someone didn't know two digits of the, they wanted six digits of a credit card. They knew four, they didn't know the two. So the customer agent like helped then basically brute force it by typing in a bunch of guesses, right? So that's something you're probably not gonna model in your model, so you might say, oh, this is a secure procedure because you miss the fact that a customer agent's going to jump out of the procedure and do something as well, okay? So anyways, put it all together, this is uh, why it's difficult uh, to, to, to work on policies and procedures. Really interesting open problem, so if any of you, it's probably too late to do a project on it now, uh, but maybe in future courses or if you're a thesis-based student, uh, I think there's probably lots of interesting research that can be done here. Okay, uh, that's it for the lecture. Any questions or comments before we go?
Okay. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah, so you walk step by step, like how does the user do it, and then at every step, every like little step along the process, you'll think about the guidelines, and you'll comment on whether it's going well according to the guidelines or it's going poorly based on the guidelines. Yeah, yeah, so, so you might not find any real critical flaws. It's more about like just seeing that you understand the process and you can apply the methodology and things like that. So the software itself, and software improves also, right, over time. And so, uh, yeah, so it's, it, I, I didn't like go out and try and find bad software per, on purpose to give it to you, knowing that there would be a lot of issues. So if, if you're not finding a lot of issues, that's, that's fine. It is pretty polished at this point. Okay, okay, if everyone can quiet down just for one sec. So the final project, uh, actually at the very first lecture of the class, yeah. I spent a bit of time going through it. So I didn't plan on saying any more than I already said there. Uh, but if you have more specific questions, I can. Okay, okay. Yeah, so the, the project is wide open, right? And the reason I do this is it's actually similar to academic research. Like, people aren't like, oh, I want to publish at a conference, and then they're like, okay, the conference is going to tell me what paper to do, right? It's like you do research on whatever you find interesting, and then if it fits under the umbrella of security and privacy, you send it to a security venue. And they might get, like, these are kind of the papers that we've accepted in the past. But there's no rule, like if you do something completely new, that's actually a, a benefit to you. So th that's why I leave it so open-ended is A, some students like that flexibility. Uh, it gives them a chance to study some weird topic uh, that, that, that as long as it has a security dimension to it. Um, and then in my reasoning as well, some students have emailed me asking for suggestions and things like that. And that's the one thing I'm really strict on is that coming up with the topic is like, it's actually part of your mark. Like, it's not explicitly marked, but if, if you don't come up with a good topic, then you're going to have a hard time, especially on the first category, which is like scope and uh, I forget exactly what I call it. But um, so a good topic is like is part of the project and you should spend like it might you might spend 25 percent of your time picking a topic and then and then 75 percent on the actual report itself or something, some obscene amount on just choosing a topic. So it's meant to be a struggle like on purpose for it. So um, yeah, so, so, but in terms of the topic itself, it, like I say, it's wide open. You can look at things that like traditionally would, you would think have nothing to do with security, right? And if there's some security or privacy dimension to it, then that's totally on topic. Um, and yeah, and then in terms of evaluation, evaluation is very easy. What I'm looking for is I don't want like a straight security paper that doesn't consider evaluation at all, okay? But to, in order to add evaluation, all you have to do is you have to say something about what are the security claims that are being made? And then how is it that the person that's making the claims justifies it basically? Like how did they arrive at it, right? Or, or how, if you're proposing something, like I say that the system should have these properties, well, how, how do you guarantee it? So you don't have to do anything we did in class. You don't have to talk about stride. You don't have to do an evaluation framework. You don't have to do a usability study. You don't have to do anything in class uh, as long as you talk about 
basically why, why is it secure? So it's one thing to just state what security means, what are the adversary's assumptions, all that, your threat model, but then the question is, okay, how are you going to go about figuring out whether your, your, your proposal actually meets the definitions or not? Okay, okay, so a chunk of your mark is actually explicitly tied to technicality. So if you look at the marking guide, you'll notice that technicality is, is one of the criteria. So I am expecting something technical, but people, when they hear technical, they think, oh, that means math, or it means computer code, or something like that. That's not what I mean by technical. All I mean is that you, you don't shy away from the details. Like, you might give a high level view because you don't need to know the details to understand it, right? That's okay, okay? But when you get to the point where you need to understand the details and the details matter, I want to see those details, okay? And that detail could just be more detailed at like English description of what's happening at the protocol. It doesn't have to be technical as in terms of like Greek symbols and computer code and math and all that type of stuff. So it just means that you don't shy away from the details. You don't hide details of the system because it's easier to talk about. Like, if, if, if you really need to explain the details, you go into that depth. So that's what I'm looking for. Okay, good. Uh, any other questions or comments? So you do have to describe step by step what the user does, and including forks. So like sometimes you might reach something where some users will go this way and this user will go this way, okay? So I want a complete description of what the user does step by step. And then you bring in the guidelines as a commentary. So if the software is doing a good job on usability, then you might bring in the guidelines to say why. Or if there's problems that you're perceiving, you, you're gonna base it on what the guidelines say. So you're going to look to try and match the problem to one of the guidelines. Yeah. And uh, the, the, on the Moodle, there's a link to, well, like for example, I wrote a paper on Tor. And if you just, you don't have to read it, but if you just sort of skip to the methodology part, if you just want to see what it looks like, like in terms of English, like it's just, you'll see it's sort of like, okay, the user does this, they see this dialogue, it says this. This is bad because of G2 and it's bad because of G7 or like you, you, you can get a feel for like kind of what it looks like. So um, you don't have to read the paper, but it, if you're not sure what it should look like, you could, that's a reference that you can look at and you can find any other cognitive walkthrough. Um, I just highlight that one because I know it obviously because I wrote it. And then it's also what we did in class as well. So you can sort of compare uh, with what we do in class. So the, I, I forget exactly, but there's no marks associated with the guidelines themselves because you can just use the guidelines that we have. So the, the second part is really just about the evaluation itself. Yeah. Yeah, you can. You won't get any marks if you do or don't. If I recall correctly, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but my... My intention anyway with the assignment is that the guidelines themselves, like the, that's not the mark. And in real life, what you would do is you would go pull guidelines out of the literature. It's actually better to do that than to make up your own, right? If you make up your own, you might miss things or, or things like that, yeah. But if you really wanna add a guideline, that's fine. And the, I mean, there's reasons that you might, like because it's a security or privacy specific thing, they, it might not be well covered by all of them. But my expectation is that you, you probably most of you will just use the, the ones that are given. Okay, I'll see you all next week.